This episode of the Religious Studies Project is sponsored by SENSAM, the Centre for the Study of Apocalyptic and Millenarian Movements. You may have seen the call for papers for their AI and Apocalypse Conference coming up. It's been in our Opportunities Digest already, but if you want to check that one out, do go to their site at sensam.org, that's C-E-N-S-A-M-M, Dot org, And you can also check out while you're there the database of millenarian movements they've been building up with Inform and uh, links to all their existing resources, conferences, videos, everything else. So do check it out. But now the regular episode. <laughs> Welcome back, listeners. It is 2018, and we're your jovial, enthusiastic, energized hosts, Christopher Carter and David Robertson. We are the Religious Studies Project. We are. It's been a. It was a we good. Are? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A good break in quotation marks, David. Yes, uh, it actually was a break for me this year, which is good. Which is uh, why I'm feeling slightly bewildered and <laughs> uh and to be find myself recording again exactly uh, time passes very quickly when one is having fun um today uh, we're going to kick straight off with another interview that sammy bishop recorded for us back over the summer of 2017 at Sokrel. and this interview is with brian turner on the political relevance of the sociology of religion take it away sammy so, I'm Sammy Bishop. I'm here at the Socrail Conference 2017, and I have with me a man who needs very little introduction, thanks to the huge influence that he's had on the field, um, and with, with Professor Brian Turner. So, welcome, and thank you for being involved with the Religious Studies Project. It's my pleasure. Great. Okay, so, um, we're going to talk today a little bit um, about teaching in Religious Studies, some of the differences between uh, the British, European and American context as well. Um, so could we start off perhaps with uh, just a little about how you became interested in this topic? Uh, well, I was converted to Methodism when I was about 17 and I was on holiday in, in Greece with a group of Methodists. Um, in the following year, I went to um, East Germany, um, Moscow and... Um, through Russia by train <laughs> and became very interested in sociology. So if you put the two together, I was a kind of Methodist with an interest in communism and Marxism, although the main influence on my work has been Max Weber. Um, I came here to the University of Leeds to do a BA and a PhD. I was in the Methodist Society. I was the president of the student Christian movement. So I had those kind of involvements. And I was taught by a famous comparative uh, religion expert, uh, Trevor Ling, who was a Buddhist scholar. And um, through him became very interested in um, comparative religion. I was appointed to the University of Aberdeen to teach the sociology of religion in 1970, I think it was, but very few students were interested in religion. And so I had very few students so I retrained as a medical sociologist, which partly explains why I have an interest in the sociology of the body and how medicine and religion connect with each other. Um, to be honest, the sociology of religion dropped out of my career a bit for those sorts of reasons. Um, I became very much interested in Max Weber, so at that level, uh, religion you know, was sort of part of my agenda, but it was also mixed up with um, you know, all the other things that Max Weber uh, was interested in and, and did work on. And to sort of finish this little biographical sketch, I mean, after 9-11, uh, just about anybody with an interest in is Islam was suddenly employable, and I had all of these kind of requests to, um, you know, to re revisit stuff that I'd done, because my first book was 1974, Weber and Islam. And I went to live in America in 19... Sorry, in 2000 and six, I think it was, and uh, I, I spent a year at Wellesley College and then ended up at the uh, Graduate Centre at the City University of New York, where I've been teaching uh, the sociology of comparative religion. And so perhaps I can say something about the teaching method, if you like. Yes, um, yeah, please do. Well, I try to make um, religion kind of relevant to the world they're living in. So, for example... During the Mitt Romney, uh, Barack Obama presidential, you know, race, 
there was a lot of material to work with. Mitt Romney was a Mormon. There was this huge debate on the uh, in in the media about whether Mormonism was a religion. So that was an easy way into talking about what we mean by religion or Mormonism or Christianity. And the other, of course, was the allegation that Obama was really a you know secret Muslim of some sort. So we had all of those debates, and then. Um, in 2016, when the Clinton-Trump confrontation started, there seemed to be almost nothing to get into because, um, and I kind of listened to every debate and read all of the stuff I could possibly get hold of. But I think Clinton mentioned religion only like once when she read a passage from the New Testament. Bernie Saunders once talked about his Jewish legacy in an interview, but it wasn't really part of his campaign and then so we had Trump you know I mean how does how does Trump relate to religion because we all know American exceptionalism religion is prominent in the public sphere um, you know just about every textbook starts with de Tocqueville's commentary on um, you know civil religion and so on and so forth and it seemed very difficult to actually believe that Trump could win the election given the fact you know these disclosures of um, his attitude towards women, his groping of women. Um, and Trump, of course, changes his position on just about everything. So at one stage, Trump was pro-life, uh, very much committed to that kind of agenda. And then, of course, during the campaign, it comes out that he's actually totally opposed to Roe versus Wade, which was the legislation that made um, abortion possible for women. Uh, he came out very strongly in favor of removing that legislation to make um, abortion either impossible or uh, increasingly difficult, um, and so on and so forth. But what sort of emerged after the election is that um, he has quite strong support from the evangelical churches. And one reason is that within the evangelical churches, there is a kind of crisis around masculinity, um, a lot of the evangelical literature has been developing the idea of the tender warrior. This is the kind of dominant male who is in charge of the family. The idea is that women's role is domestic and women really kind of prefer to be subordinated to men rather than to be liberated. And that, um, you know, part of the crisis in America is connected with the acceptance of gays in the military you know, the legislation that made possible same-sex marriage in some states. Um, the general kind of reception of um, alternative forms of sexuality, particularly on the East Coast. So some of this election was about East Coast versus, you know, the southern states and so forth. Um, so Jerry Falwell has come out very much in favor of Trump. Uh, Trump visited Liberty University, which is run by Falwell, the... Uh, uh, one of the founders of the moral majority. And so my puzzlement about, you know, how could Trump possibly get support from religious groups has been partly answered by this idea that there is a kind of deep anxiety in conservative America about the status of men um, and connected to the rise of women into pink collar occupations, the uh, better performance of women in education, um, the growth or the presence of influential women in the, um, you know, in leadership positions, you know, Merkel in Germany, the head of the IMF and, um, you know, the Fed, the Fed and so forth, that you see women in very powerful political positions. And insofar as populism and Trump are connected to the erosion of the blue-collar male-white working class, you can kind of understand partly why Trump is, um, you know, getting support from uh, from evangelicals. But, I mean, I would point out a couple of things. I mean, Trump and Clinton were the least um, attractive, least supported um, presidential candidates in the whole of American history. Um, Clinton did win the popular vote, despite Trump's claims that it was all f fake. Um, so, I mean, one, I mean, Trump has huge support from his base, but he's still a very problematic figure within American culture, I think, and, and has divided society 
you know, really right, right down the middle, and so one, one never knows what is going to happen next, really, in America. Mm, mm. Could you say more about the idea of populism itself and how the uh, that concept has kind of become more yeah. relevant, perhaps, at the moment? Well, people have been studying populism for a long time, and there are arguments that populism has been present in American politics for a long time, such as the People's Party and and so forth. That agrarian populism has been a notion around for some time. But I agree with you that, you know, in the last 12 months, populism has been everywhere, conferences, journal articles, books, and so on and so forth. And, I mean, it looked as, at one stage, it was that populist parties would sweep through Europe with the Northern League and the Golden Dawn and the Freedom Party in Austria and so forth. And then we've had this like pause, if you like, in which Macron in France has won the election and, uh, and, uh, you know, to some extent the, 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 the uh, popular vote for extreme positions on, on foreigners has been, uh, slowed down a bit. And then I think there's Brexit, which, um, Again, you know, I mean, UKIP, having had some electoral successes, you know, has virtually disappeared as a party. Um, and it looks as though the, the complexity of Brexit may, you know, sort of grind it into the ground eventually. Who, who knows? <coughs> but a lot of the populist literature has been saying that Britain is slightly different from other societies in the sense that the populist vote here is sort of weaker than you'll find in, say, Italy, <coughs> and so forth. I mean, one issue is to what extent Thatcherism was a, an earlier form of populism. Um, she did want to, you know, sort of change everything. She had these strong views about an inside and an outside. I mean, one of the def defining characteristics of populism is that it divides the world into us and them, and then you've got the people on the one side and then enemies on the other. And, um, I mean, as we've heard in this conference, I mean, the enemies seem to be connected to, uh, you know, Muslim refugees in, uh, in Europe and so forth. But again, looking at this from the outside, that is from America, well, I mean, what struck me was the antagonism towards East Europeans. So, I mean, you know, Polish people were uh, being criticised by, you know, uh, conservative people who wanted to argue that the welfare state was being kind of exploited by free riders from other countries. So I don't think it's just Islam. There's all sorts of, you know, sort of things going on about um, the inside world and the outside world. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, the Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, um, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash project rs and subscribing we know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people in their learning so if you can help um either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the paypal button on our website it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing you this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia but now back to the episode where do you see it going in the future well i was reminiscing when the, in the 1960s and 1970s and really into the 80s, I suppose. We had the three-day week. We had the uh, the minor strike. We had the poll tax strikes. And whilst Thatcher was hugely popular against again amongst her base, and while she was in many ways the most successful prime, prime minister we've had, she won three elections, etc., etc. Living through that period, I mean, Britain did seem amazingly unstable. I mean, just visually, you know, we had piles of rubbish piled up in the streets. Uh, electricity was very limited, you know. I remember, you know, having to teach with no heating in the university because so we all wore, wore overcoats and hats and gloves to go to work sitting in classrooms. And um, the current period feels like that as well, you know, because um, I think if Brexit fails, the people that vote to leave will be deeply frustrated. I mean, Nigel Farage has threatened to come back to politics if that happens. Um, the legislative mess seems horrendous. 
And then looking at the broader picture, we've got what you might call strongman politics in, in the Philippines, in China, in Russia, and so forth. And to some extent, these some of these figures, at least, are mobilizing religion to bolster their position. I think very interesting is Putin, who you know, allegedly has an, an, an Orthodox priest, as a, a, an Eastern Orthodox priest as a counsellor. He's obviously appealing to orthodoxy as a way of defining what it is to be Russian. Um, but it's a fairly complicated picture, I think. Um, again, I suppose I should have said about Trump that Trump's foreign policy looks, you know, deeply worrying. Um, again, because he seems to want to undermine much of the, many of the institutions that have, you know, bolstered European peace for 70 years or so. And there is this figure, Stephen Bannon, who is a conservative Catholic with an Irish background, who I think is, you know, mobilizing uh, Trump's foreign policy. And I think that's very problematic. So I think from an academic point of view, I mean, religion, I think, is going to be very central to all of these debates, whether it's conflicts between Christians and Muslims in the Middle East or Buddhists and Muslims in Asia or, you know, Catholic and um, Pentecostalists and Protestants elsewhere. Mm -hmm. How do you think uh, scholars of religion or sociologists of religion are best approaching it? Well, in the talk I'm going to give this evening, I think sociology of religion kind of bifurcates into those that are into spirituality and post-institutional churches and those who, following people like Jose Casanova, are interested in public religion. Um, my question is, how can we make sociology of religion central to the sociological enterprise as a whole? And I think the public religions debate um, pushes the sociology of religion into political theory, into international relations, into race relations and so forth, and creates a kind of an agenda where sociology is, of religion is once more part of the mainstream rather than, you know, a minority interest on the margins, as it were. And this conference, I'm going to get the title of the conference wrong, but on the edge, um, you know, are we part of the periphery or part of the mainstream? I think is an important question. I personally don't want to be on the periphery. I mean, I think sociology of religion is central to the modern, you know, world. If you look at, I mean, everywhere, basically, Israel, Brazil, America, uh, Germany, France. I mean, it's hard, it's difficult to find a country that doesn't have some kind of religious issue going mm. that I think is, um, you know, something we need to address, really. Mm. When you speak about the political aspects and, uh, for example, race relations as well, do you think um, mm. there's a certain amount of activism that could be involved in the sociology of religion? Well, I certainly think sociology needs to contribute to solutions. And whether that's social policy or becoming engaged in activism, I think... Um, is something we can't sort of predict in advance, so to speak. But I, th I think that sociologists can't describe the mess we're in without taking some responsibility for just suggesting ways we might get out of this mess. Um, otherwise, we might all, all bathe in misery and melancholy. And, and um, you know, what would be the point of having a conference like this? We might as well stay at home and be miserable, you know, so... And I, I mean, I, this is too big a topic for this interview, but I tend to think sociologists are always looking at failure, failed institutions, failed constitutions, failed social movements, fail this, that and the other. And I think we need to sort of turn this round a bit and sort of say, OK, well, can we find any successful institutions or successful social movements or successful, you know, philosophies or whatever that have, you know, improved uh, human condition, even if it's for a short time. So, I, I mean, my argument is that no institution lasts forever. They all have, you know, sort of fluctuating histories, I mean, of success and failure. But the idea that all institutions are somehow uh, failing um, is an impossible kind of position to take. I mean, I tend to say that there's no such thing as consistent pessimism because we wouldn't be having this interview if you and I were consistently pessimistic, as it were, I don't think. Uh, you know, we'd be getting drunk or something. Um, so I, I think that, I, I mean, I haven't been an activist, I mean, I haven't been an activist in that.
traditional sort of sense. But I mean, I've edited the journal Citizenship Studies for about 20 years, which I see as making a contribution to understanding the kind of erosion of of social rights over the last uh, 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. And that citizenship, a revitalized citizenship would be some kind of answer to questions about social solidarity and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now I'm beginning to lose my voice. I don't know if we can keep this interview to a limited period. Yeah. Because I, I, have, I have to speak in a while. But Yeah, just one, one more question. Yeah, sure. Do you see, when you speak about uh, citizenship, do you see any role for religion in that idea? Um, well, I mean, there are arguments that a lot of our notions of rights come out of well, I mean, some people would argue that a lot of our notion of rights come out of the, the Protestant Reformation. But more recently, I mean, the Catholic Church was to some extent responsible for developing the concept of human dignity, which was the underpinning to the Declaration of Human Rights. And then I think, you know, the Christian democratic tradition in, in Europe was part of this um, sort of development. But I mean, I think that the sociology of religion can contribute to you know, a more sophisticated understanding of what Judaism is or Islam or other religions or what Sikhism is about and so forth. And so I think, you know, there's a, bit, there's a basic kind of educational role to um, undermine false assumptions about, you know, what happens to Muslim women and, uh, or, you know, what, what Judaism has been about. Thanks, Sammy. A really interesting, wide-ranging uh, conversation there. Uh, Brian Turner, uh, quite an important figure in sociology of religion in Britain. So great to finally have him on. And um, listeners might also be interested in checking out the series that we did um, on behalf of Sacre Hill uh, last year. Uh, it was a seven-part series on, on the sociology of religion, particularly um, the, the final episode, the compilation one on New Horizons in the Contemporary Sociology of Religion. Yes, and we will be present at this year's Socrail conference coming up in the summer. Do you know the date, Chris? Um, uh, it, it's very early July. And it's Glasgow, I believe. Yeah, well, in Glasgow at the University of Strathclyde. University of Strathclyde, excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about what other <laughs> things are coming up this year that we're going to be yeah. at. I mean, well, um, uh, on Wednesday of this week, um, we are both participating in a uh, a roundtable discussion here at the University of Edinburgh with the, the other executive members of the British Association for the Study of Religions, who are one of our beneficent sponsors. Thank you. So that's on engaging the public um, with the the academic study of religion. We're hoping to record that. If it works out well, you might hear it. Indeed, yeah. I feel like the title should have a question mark after it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We'll stir the pot indeed, there, no indeed. doubt. And um, um, you you you've heard us banging on. Um, since September about our Patreon page. Um, we've got up to 17 patrons now. We're still aiming for 100 though. So this can be your new 2018 resolution. If you haven't signed up to give even a dollar a month, um, perhaps consider it. And a special mention to Mark Smith, um, who used one of our other donation options. He used the PayPal button on our website to send us a, a one-off donation. That's Greatly appreciated, Mark. You can also do that too. Yeah, thanks to Mark and thanks to everyone who donates anything at all. It's all appreciated and it all goes to making the project better, to supporting uh, the transcriptions, to supporting the many postgraduate students who give up their time free and willingly to make this project possible and to provide this ever-growing catalogue of teaching and learning resources free to everyone. So thank you all. You can come back next week to hear a special roundtable discussion uh, that we recorded at this year's BASR conference on um, basically on the work of E.B. Tyler. Yeah, on the legacy of E.B. Tyler in, in sort of more contemporary uh, scholarship and the, the importance more generally of, you know, how much attention really should we pay to these old uh, theorists is there were is it worth thinking about their work at all in the contemporary university so uh, do come back for that and um as ever um i think i just have to say thanks for listening yeah thanks for listening 
The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The RSP is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SCO 47750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson and our managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash project rs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals. <laughs>